And we are live. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Modern Sales Pros panel on keeping your prospects and customers engaged, sponsored by our friends at Uber for Business. Before we jump into that and get to learn a little bit more about our panelists, um, for those of you who are just joining in, launching a quick poll here. This is about your organization, and if you had a bunch of business development energy, where would you spend that? Uh, that's going to help our panelists as we dive into the second half of our conversation today. So just go ahead and take a second and fill that poll out as you're getting in and getting settled here. And then for our panelists, we've got some new faces and some familiar faces. Tracy, this isn't your first time on an MSP panel, but you know we have a tradition here start of the pandemic, any new hobbies that you've picked up or skills that you've started to refine yes, since the start things. of the pandemic? Um, two things. We got a golden doodle puppy, like, you know, half the people in the United States have cleaned out all of the, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, shelters and such. We had allergy problems in my family. So we got a puppy named Coco who just turned a year old. So we've gotten her pre pandemic, but, and, and then the other one's lemon cake. I make a really good lemon cake. Um, and I've probably made it once a week for my family, and uh, I can post the recipe later if anyone wants it. Super easy. That, that sounds delicious. And a golden noodle, too. It sounds like the best of all worlds. <laughs> all right. And Tim, Tim new, to, new to MSP panels, but certainly a friend of the family. Uh, any, any new hobbies, skills, tricks you picked up since coronavirus started? Yeah, I, I tell you what, like eliminating commute time and as someone who travels every single week, uh, airport uh, and time zone changes uh, has left me with uh, a lot more time on my hands. But uh, I will say it's, uh, it's actually trying to exercise and run. Uh, running was like the punishment before in sports, but like it's like, okay, I'm going to get outside. I need to get outside of my office during the day and actually get some vitamin D because you're the one thing I miss about the office is getting up and walking around and seeing people. So that three hours from a commute and all the airplane and airport time back is a little bit more, eating more healthy, exercising a little bit more and running is never something I thought I would ever say was a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Pick it up. That's a new one. That's a healthy one too in the, in the face of the pandemic. Uh, and then finally, Josh, any, any new hobbies, anything you picked up maybe, maybe uh, since the start of the pandemic? I think um, my wife has, increased her um, baking activity and I probably picked up the hobby of just making sure I try everything um, which has been um, really really good over the past you know six months call it bread cakes anything I can get my hands on that's that's been the the quick hobby that's that, that's a delicious one I think we're, we may have to put together a recipe book after this uh, after this panel a creative way to keep your prospects and customers engaged <laughs> all right folks we're gonna get started here we got a very high octane panelists we've got a, a, a lot to get through today so folks this is a rough agenda we've heard some opening remarks from the team we're gonna get the panelists to introduce themselves here and then we're really gonna jump in we're gonna spend the majority of our time today talking about keeping uh, creative strategies to keep your customers and your prospects engaged. We'll set a baseline, talk a little bit about what's changed, talk about some evergreen strategies, give you some distinct takeaways to make sure that you've got something that you're leaving here with. But before we jump into that, just a few words about Modern Sales Pros. For those of you who don't know or who aren't members, welcome. Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest sales leadership community. For those who are in revenue leadership disciplines like sales management, the supporting disciplines like sales and revenue operations, and the other disciplines that help make the money happen. So you think sales enablement, sales engineering, our friends in growth and marketing. One of the great parts about the community is it's an environment where you can ask questions you may other, otherwise struggle to solve on your own. And it's not limited to just any one of these organizations. Anytime you ask a question of the community, you can actually get responses from across the whole spectrum of these amazing organizations from panelists like those who are joining us today and from the other 5,000 companies that are in the group. But enough about modern sales pros. Today, it wouldn't be possible without the sponsorship from the team at Uber for Business. I'm going to hand this off to Josh to say a few words. Yeah, I think, you know, six years ago, we built Uber for Business on the power of Uber's platform. Um, Uber for Business is really just an, an enterprise-grade enterprise um, platform, and it enables the companies that leverage Uber to bill, report, and manage their meals, their ground transportation, their deliveries, all from a single place. 
um, we really just try and focus on the uh, efficiencies um, of our platform to send data to our partners. Um, obviously leveraging also at the same time Uber's unmatched scale and geo coverage. Um, so it's really, if you think about Uber for Business, it's really just a one-stop shop to enable um, all sorts of businesses to become more efficient with their spend on our platform. Awesome. We're excited. We're excited to have you here today, and we're excited to have all of our amazing panelists. So just two housekeeping notes before we give our panelists a second to introduce themselves. Uh, the recording will be made available afterwards. I know that's always the first question that folks ask. And then secondly, a couple of new folks have come in. Just go ahead and take a second and work through that simple, simple poll that we have. We're going to be using that to shape our discussion in the second half today. Now, Tracy, I'll give it over to you to introduce yourself. Please share. Sure. I'm a B2B marketer, have been since I was 16. My very first job was a sales development rep at a software company where I went by the generic name Chris Kelly, along with the other high school kids that answered the phones there. Uh, so I've basically grown up very aligned with sales. Um, I'm married to a sales VP. Today I'm CMO at Inside View, which is a B2B data and intelligence company. And I'm also a founding board member of Women in Revenue, which is an organization designed for women like the women in modern sales pros. Um, and so it's an adjacent organization. Would love to have members cross over. And, and actually, I need to talk to you guys separately about doing something together um, in terms of a campaign. But that's me. And Josh, go ahead. You can introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. Um, really happy to be here. Um, he, my career um, really started in, in, in sales. I, um, uh, like Tracy, have been selling since I'm 16, born and raised in Manhattan, had a um, lemonade stop, uh, lemonade um, store at uh, the 86th and 3rd um, subway station. So that's where things began for me. And then obviously, um, progressed from there. So uh, in 16, I led IC um, as a, a, a director of um, US Canada sales, leading the first digital advertising team across platforms such as Cro uh, College Humor, Match.com, Daily Beast. Um, really a transformational experience under um, Barry Diller's guidance and leadership. Um, left uh, in uh, uh, six and a half years later and went to um, Clout, which uh, my roommate actually founded. Um, which was a, a sort of a measure of um, people's um, influence across social media. We rewarded people based on that influence. Um, I was one of the first um, 10 employees. We scaled that business out um, and eventually sold it uh, to Lithium Technologies for 250 million in 2014. Um, and then take you to the present. Um, now I'm at um, obviously Uber for Uber. I've been at Uber for four and a half years, leading Uber for businesses. Um, U.S. Canada efforts, uh, which encompasses both our delivery efforts and our rides business. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Satterwhite. So uh, I'm currently the Chief Revenue Officer at Terminus, um, a, a bit of an interesting modern, what I'll call a modern CRO, CRO role. Uh, I own sales. I also own um, customer success and professional services. So really a focus on customer lifetime value is kind of how we think about it and kind of what's that longer horizon as, as we engage with our customers and are we signing the right customers. Uh, prior to this, I was part, uh, I played a small part in the big journey of Braze. So uh, I joined at 16 million in revenue uh, and helped the team grow to 100 million before I hopped over to Terminus. Uh, and ahead of that, I, was, uh, I come from the Salesforce tree as I like to say. So uh, hearkening back to the early marketing cloud days of uh, those, those that remember the social enterprise and Radiant 6 and Buddy Media and Exact Target. Um, so help uh, build that out. And uh, actually at uh, both Braves and Terminus, there's a lot from that, uh, that marketing cloud tree here to work with. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. And we're, we're excited. We're excited to have all three of you. And uh, just one more housekeeping note before we jump into things. Please do, for our attendees, please do use the Q&A panel. You have the ability to upvote those questions that come in. So if you see somebody ask a good question, go ahead and upvote that, throw a comment on it. We'll be using that to either answer your questions directly as part of our session here today, or we'll be using that to maybe follow up afterwards. Maybe Tracy or Tim or Josh really like the point that you made, wants to provide some additional context and so on. So with that, 
let's jump into this a little bit here. I'm excited. I mean, our prep session was phenomenal for this. But let's let's get started here. And Josh, let's let's start with you. Just to give the audience some perspective here, you know, how has the pandemic changed things in terms of how you engage with your prospects, your customers, and your employees? Both positive, surprising things and things that were maybe not the best. Yeah, I you know, take a step back, I would just say our overall business, like everyone else, um, uh, on the Zoom was was obviously uh, hit pretty hard. We began 2020 um, really on an accelerated path to profitability. The virus hits, and um, you know, obviously, uh, like everyone else, people stayed home, and and our rides business, which is really our main um, profit generator, was down. I you know probably 80 percent at its peak, and so w w today we see limited signs of recovery, but. Um, it comes off a really, really deep hole, and we really don't have visibility into the speed and shape of the the recovery. And so we we honestly, right at the start in early March, knew we had to make hard decisions on directions. Um, it, it it wasn't to protect the stock price or to please boards um, our board or our investors. We really made the direction to say, okay, what what products can we put put in front of our customers? Um, to really help them get out of a hole and also help um, our overall business. So the Eats business took off like a rocket ship in H1. Um, it grew more than 150 to 200 percent over the course of those three months and really strengthened our position in, in key competitive markets across the U.S. And so we really rebranded our efforts um, through the Eats business and, and really repositioned it as almost delivery. So delivery of everything, B2B, B2C. Um, and it really signaled sort of our broader ambitions, not to just power food during the uh, pandemic, but to really power local commerce um, and, to, and to help um, the customers we serve. Um, and so obviously COVID has accelerated the category's growth. Um, you've seen a, a shift in, in consumer behavior moving towards delivery. And so we really wanted to take advantage of that situation uh, and, and not only, um, help our customers but also um, drive help drive the demand for our food delivery business and so we've tried a variety of different things as everyone on the call has we've we've thrown a lot against the wall but i think we're really lucky that our uber for business platform offers multiple solutions so we've got the food delivery we've got um, our direct business which is our b2b b2c delivery and then we just launched um, eats for business as well which which really enables our customers um, to order food through our Eats um, service, but use a dashboard to have better efficiencies and controls and policies over the way their employees um, uh, uh, eat. Um, and so we've learned also how to really talk with our customers. We've, we've, we've stressed empathy and we really customize our solutions to fit everyone's needs, obviously, in, this, in, in these current days. I think that's I think that's a great perspective and also working from some strong first principles there. Of, hey, what can we do that makes it easier for our customers that make it better for their customers and their experience? I, I love that. Uh, Tracy, I know you've seen a lot and you've been a part of a lot of a lot of fun things, but what's what's kind of going on? What have you seen? Um, how has this made for you, your prospects, your customers, your employee engagement better? What's what was surprising? What was it? Yeah, you know, we all were accelerating to all things digital pre-COVID, right? Everyone was trying to address their B2B buyers, just like what happens in the B2C world. Like we have all these expectations about how easy it is to buy and consume things, order food online or, you know, stream something on Netflix. We're sort of already expecting that our B2B experience is going to be like that. So that was the baseline, like last fall. And, you know, what I'm seeing now is that everything is accelerated just that much faster. Everyone's in lockdown. You know, how are you going to reach them? Um, and everything's in this format, right? This sterile format that is, you know, we're all sitting on our butts all day. So I think what we're seeing is more rapid acceleration of digital. We are having many more conversations, which is funny. Like, I, I think most people thought, like, how am I going to reach anybody? A lot of workers are, you know, forwarding to their home office. People are posting their cell phones, they're engaging on social. That's a big one, a big change I would say is that our sellers are doing much more interaction via social channels. I just heard yesterday from one of my SDRs, now granted he's like 23 years old, big runner though, Tim. 
he actually networked with two different prospects on Strava, that app that's tracking his running data. Like, I mean, like that was the funniest thing I ever heard. So, you know, I think that the acceleration to digital and new channels, and the last thing I'd like to say is conversational marketing, AKA a chat bot that's not a robot, has become a very big part of our website. And we are seeing more and more visitors coming and wanting to have a real-time conversation with a human being. And, you know, that's taking over, Latney Conan at Six Sense likes to call it, no more forums, no more calls. You know, that's going from stranger to conversation to opportunity in a nice streamlined format. They stay anonymous for a super long time. It's busting my lead funnel completely, but you know, that immediate conversation. And then also using things like Terminus has, right? Like we're we can target people out in the market much better. So kind of all of those things are becoming increasing in importance. So you need to make sure your team's like really ready to grasp it. I think that, and I, we, we're big fans of what Latney put out um, here at MSP as well. And I think, Tim, you've got an interesting perspective on this because you've been at Terminus for just a little while now, but Fryer had spent a bunch of time in B2C marketing. What's, what's changing? What are the similarities that you see? How are things going at Terminus? Yeah, so it, it's pretty interesting. I mean, Chase, you hit on it, but the acceleration, uh, especially for account-based marketing, uh, everything was, was moving digital. Now, guess what? Those large conferences where you generate a ton of your demand, your field sales teams may be marginalized because they're not, not out walking the halls. We still need to run our businesses. How are we getting in front of people? And then from, from our space, there's been consolidation and acquisition and things like that as well. So it's, it's been um, everything we thought was going to happen in three years happened in three months, which has been fun to build and react to. Um, but, you, you know, looking at the B2C to B2B space, um, I talk about it constantly, like our expectations as, as consumers um, of, you know, who I am to you, to your brand, what I've bought from you, having some context, that context is the biggest thing of contextual selling and marketing. Like, yes, it's going to come into our business lives and, and, you know, B2B tech generally lags behind the B2C space, but like that expectation has been set and now B2B will catch up. And so that's where we have a lot of the conversations around like, Hey, do you understand who I am? And, and in the ABM space, it's an understanding of like, Hey, um, you know, it's not 200 leads or 200 people. It's actually 23 accounts we're trying to engage with type thing. So how are we having those contextual conversations and doing that? And, and to your point and some of the, the research McKinsey put out, um, you know, Tracy, uh, in chat, you know, it's, it's immediate gratification. It's access to a human or access to knowledge or access to set some time, get an answer. Like the channels with which people and how they want to engage and how they want to buy and how they want to get information are, are evolving pretty rapidly because we're fundamentally operating a different way. Like we're not in our offices, we're not going to lunch, we're not hosting dinners, we're not at conferences. And so these things, um, they've just been highlighted more than anything else, right? Uh, and, and that's something where looking at your business, what's working, what's not, where we redeployed resources, it, it's an interesting one that we're, you know, us as a company, we're, we're reforecasting quarterly at this point. I had a board meeting today, like we're going through and understanding and, and constantly looking at this and we feel bold enough now to look six months out uh, in, in terms of that sense, in terms of what we're working for our business. But, you know, best advice I ever got from uh, a, a senior marketer at Lego is build a team that can handle change. You know what I mean? Like, cause it is going to change. <laughs> Uh, I think I think that that's I think that that's a great point. I think Brian Halligan from HubSpot talked about this a lot, like the consumerization of the enterprise buying experience, which is crazy to think about six or even twelve months ago. That's a that feels five years away. Now it's like, oh man, yeah, I want to I want to swipe a credit card and get instant gratification right now, not later, right now. Um, and I love it. So folks, we're going to wrap the poll up and then kind of move forward here. I'll share the results with everybody um, and I'll give our panelists just a second here to digest as we start to talk a little bit more about, you know, what our baseline was. Now we'll talk a little bit more about what's changed. And I think what's interesting from our audience here today, given, you know, given a uh, hundred uh, business development units of energy, the, a good healthy chunk of our audience would really split that 50-50 between new logo and expansion. And then there's a, the next biggest piece of that is, you know, mostly on new logo, put a, a lot of chips on new logo and not quite as many on expansion. But again, that 50-50 split. And I think this would have been different had we done had this conversation five or six months ago, right? I think right now we're recognizing, just to state the obvious, the importance of keeping our customers and really spending dollars on expanding in our customers versus just spending dollars on getting logos in and figure it out, uh, you know, on the other side of it. 
And Tracy, I know this is something where we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about this, both offline and I know Inside View's done a ton on this, but like what's, what's changing, right? How are strategies evolving? How are you seeing them evolve and how are you evolving them in response to this, this kind of ever constant um, yeah. threat and challenge that the pandemic are present? I, um, I love that poll and it's something that I'm asking almost every marketer that I'm talking to because I, I first saw a question like that done about four years ago by Forrester and they asked this big audience, you know, what's your split? And it was like 85% new logo and like this teeny little bit over here that was maybe spent on customer reference work or something. And, and it is morphing dramatically into more of a 50-50 balance up or down on one dial or another, but it's way more equal than it used to be. And I, and I think it's because of this. I think there's so many businesses who have big customer bases and we all know that, you know, selling more to the same customer costs you less than bringing in that new customer. So that's kind of thing one. Thing two is that if you are a subscription business, your retention metric is really, really important in terms of your value in the marketplace. So we've got to pay attention to it. And, and I really think of like kind of four stages. If you go through like only new logo and only customer, there's sort of middle stages, which are get the customer then get them to adopt your product and get to success, then earn the right to upsell them other things, then earn the right to be um, asking them to be a customer advocate. And those kind of big four chunks of motion really happen in a flow, right? You can't ask somebody to be an advocate um, if they haven't had a good experience with your product. And I really believe marketing has a role to play at every step and his sales has a role to play at every step. And we need to be planning together using that poll as a way to unify. So you mean to tell me after you buy, it's not the right time to ask you to buy more? I should I should wait and let you adopt? This is, this is crazy, Tracy. This is yeah, crazy. Yeah, let's make sure you're <laughs> successful really fast. A lot of companies don't pay well, attention and, as much as they should, right? Well, and I, I think that the, the interesting part of this, and then, uh, you know, Tim, I mean, this is this is some of the stuff that we dealt with back in the, the mobile app days, right? Like, don't don't spend your dollars trying to acquire new users. It's way cheaper to get your existing ones to do more. In Now, kind of bringing this into more of an MSP context, how have you evolved things? You mentioned you changed forecasting, you know, would you say every every quarter, right? And now you feel comfortable looking a, a couple a couple quarters out, but specifically on you know, prospecting strategies, what have you adopted or changed or done some things differently here? Yeah, so, so probably to go into some of the, the changes, uh, just in terms of kind of like, like it hurts. It's, we all know it's cheaper to keep a customer than, than get a new one. Um, the world we're living in right now, I tell you what, every, to get a new vendor onboarded, to get everything approved, especially when you're, if you're in mid-market and growth right there, the CFO is reviewing everything going through. Like, so your deal cycles, your timelines are going to be expanded because there's additional scrutiny here. Um, and so that's just something from a new business perspective. It's a rough environment out there and people are looking to get more out of what they already have in terms of who they're working with. And so the, the customer conversations we have, but when we talk about engagement, our customers are much more engaged with us right now, actually, because they're also being asked to provide honestly some like some hard metrics what are we getting out of this investment what are we doing and they're working more directly with us on strategy and adoption and making sure they're, they're getting the most out of everything uh, because budgets are being cut and people want to do you know more with less and so it's it's been really interesting to work with folks like that um and we in particular like we talk about retention as the new acquisition like we've been hitting it hard and the ability to grow that customer base and, and tracy the way we talk about it internally is uh how many customers already have that conversation about doing more with us, right? Like you, you don't get the, you don't get the right to have that conversation unless they're producing with what you're selling them and they have a good relationship with you. Um, and so we, you've got to earn the right to have the conversation. And then on the other side of that is, you know, when you look at your business, do you have products that continue to grow the value that align with each other within that buying center? Right. So that expansion, that expansion motion. So when we talk about prospecting into the customer base, like, if you're selling something that a totally different buyer has to go pay for, that's, that's harder, right? And so as we think about working with product and marketing across this, are there near midterm product releases where we can grow our base that add value with the same buyer and things like that, which is really important to think about because if not, it's kind of a whole new cycle uh, on some of that. But, you know, the prospecting side has gotten interesting and, and we talk a lot um, about second call value add, if you will. So do I have an understanding of what you're trying to achieve um, and do these things, but we kind of dangle that carrot of, hey, we'll come in and we'll share some of our, whether you, it has really compelling internal data you have in terms of what people are doing, or if you can provide some value to them, 
uh, in terms of looking at their business and, and pulling some data and sharing with them. Like that aspect of, I'm not going to come ask you to go through a demo and sales cycle. Like, here's what you'll get out of this very hard and clear and be able to do that. And as long as you can deliver on that, you know, that's where people want to have an understanding of like, okay, I'm willing to do more with you. Cause like time is finite. Yes. You provided value. Let's have a conversation. What we can actually do. So we've done a lot around customer engagement um, round tables. We've also done a lot where we try and marry zoom with some offline activities. Um, so, and this is totally coincidental. I promise you, Josh didn't, pay me anything for this, but we use Uber Eats um, where we'll do lunch and learns or um, dinner, like early dinner and learns. Um, our most popular with marketers are wine and learns. So that's a drizzly one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but starting to marry that experience and it's something that people can rally around and do that. And so if you have the opportunity to get more people from a base, like we'll, um, Terminus wrote a book, uh, ABM is B2B. Um, we'll send the entire marketing department. The book is a pre-read. We'll say, we'll then do kind of a two hour workshop on these topics with you. And we, we send the materials and like post-its and things like this to make it a bit more interactive because I don't know about you, but around 2, 2.30, Zoom fatigue is in uh, and I really don't want to be another one. So whatever we can do to marry that um, and like honestly liven it up and provide some value to exit with, like you can give them value and they can walk away with, even if they don't buy your product, that's someone that will come back and potentially work with you. Oh, Tim, I, I think that that's phenomenal. I love that notion of like the second call value add rate. How do I, how do I kind of get you fired up about what you're going to get and not just check in or say, Hey, uh, Hey, Tracy, I haven't heard from you. Just checking in. I love that. Uh, Josh, you know, when you were, when you were talking about some of the transitions that your business went through, you mentioned on a lot of empathy, a lot of customization with what the offer could be. It seems like that would make prospecting be a little bit of a, of a challenge in, in some way. So how, how did you kind of change and morph your prospecting strategy as the pandemic kind of ran on here? Yeah, it's super interesting for us. We, we, we really started to listen to our customers and see how they were using our products. And we really started to just um, drink our own champagne and watch the way they were using our own products to drive engagement with prospects and customers. And then we actually leveraged our own products on virtual events and webinars um, and peer connects to um, uh, provide sort of a, a, a funnel for us um, as a lead, as a lead funnel for us. But also, you know, while our, you know, so obviously frustrating for everybody on the call, our grand sales plan we had going into 2020 um, obviously needed to be revised. And so, you know, with the world being different, we really started by adjusting forecasts first, right? We, we planned for the worst um, and prepared for the best. And um, we really looked to just decrease, um, you know, we looked at a plan to decrease our gross bookings um, based on our rides business. And then we spent some time really triaging our pipeline and it gave us a line of sight into basically the sales organization and where we should be spending our time um, for the, the duration of the year and, and, and potentially longer. Um, we wanted our folks, our leaders to be honest with the process, really avoid um, giving us a, a misleading narrative. Um, and really what we did was, is we started by just identifying, you know, key industries which were most affected by COVID um, both positively and negatively, we determined sort of how our EATS product would fit into um, each uh, vertical, what the sort of top initiatives should be, what the challenges would be. And then we really went through an exer exercise where we looked at the level of risk of each account, where we could expand, um, where we could, where we should sort of push back and, and not be so proactive. Um, and then we classified sort of renewals as well. Um, looking at, you know, who was a risk and, and who wasn't. Um, and, and, and I think doing that will set us up um, for future success as well. So as things clear up with COVID, I, I think this is getting us in the right sort of mindset um, to how we evaluate our business um, moving forward. Josh, you mentioned something. You said, you know, we wanted, we wanted to encourage folks to be honest with the process. At a high-growth venture-backed SaaS company with massive goals. That's a big behavioral change. How did you how did you enact that change in your in your organization? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, it, it, it's taken a lot of time, but I think really how we shifted to keep our sales team highly motivated is closely connected with that. And I thought about that and sort of 
put it in five pillars, five or six pillars, but it's really to create a sense of belonging for the, for the, for the reps, the BDRs, the account management teams. Um, you know, I, I can't stress how much communication and, um, you know, um, Zoom stand-ups and happy hours just to sort of make everybody feel that they're on top of the information. Um, you know, we, we're obviously showing empathy on those calls, but we're also during those calls soliciting ideas. Um, you know, I, I don't go on those calls pretending to know all the answers, but I do give them a frame of reference of what's working. Um, we provide guidance on those calls, so it's, it's, it's great. And then I think also through enablement, um, teamwork, collaboration, through that collaboration, you sort of get your message across of this is what's going to work moving forward. Um, obviously, welcoming feedback uh, along the way. And then I think it's about recognizing and rewarding good work. And that good work sort of ties into your original question, which is to just keep a good hygiene about yourself when you think about just your pipeline and your forecast. Um, and then obviously, you know, the main point for me is to just really show the employees that their work is meaningful by sharing success stories, obviously. Um, helping employees cope through these times is a big one for us too. And then we wanna be able to give our employees, um, you know, you really wanna trust them to make decisions. Um, you know, the world is just uh, upside down. So it's impossible for me as a leader to really control everything the employees um, are doing, the teams are doing. And so I give them as much direction as I can and um, in, in, in as much time as I can. But I think we've all got to trust our, our teams to do what's right. Um, and that's sort of what's going to help us get through this and really will carry over, I think, once the crisis subsides and, and create the right behavior moving forward. I think that's great. Behavior, behavior change is real, real tough. And especially when you're dealing with the global pandemic and all the other challenges that are easy to be distracted by. I, I, I love I, I love the point on honesty and being honest with the process. And Tracy, we got this a great registration question coming in and it's almost like a two parter, but we'll, we'll give you the first part first. Prospect is, uh, you know, maybe not on and uh, not an active opportunity or it's a very long term opportunity. How do I how what have you seen folks do to keep them engaged, um, even if maybe they're not immediately ready to buy? Um, I will answer that in a couple of ways. Um, I mean, it happens all the time, right? Like shoppers are shopping, you're thinking about things, you're doing research, right? And the best experiences are the ones that continue to feed you useful information along the way as you're continuing to make your decision, whether you're buying a bicycle or, you know, going off the grid from cable like we did in our house or, you know, or buying software, right? So staying engaged with useful content on a regular cadence, I think is key and marketing usually will drive that. But let's say that you're a, you're a sales rep and you know, do you keep trying to nurture that group or do you go after the deals you got to close? And in my experience, you're going after the deals you got to close, right? And you only have so much time in the day. That's where your partnership with marketing is really key. Like making sure marketing allows you to say like, Hey, let's put rich back into a sequence where, He's staying warm during the opportunity and I can see when he's interacting. I'm the sales rep and I can see that. And I can also see intense signals surging when, you know, Rich starts showing interest again. And then, you know, the, make the back end do the hard work to then surface the action back to the sales rep. It's a little bit complicated, but, you know, when you boil it down to those just two thoughts that you got to keep that person warm, keep them, giving them a give and then help automation help you figure out when to resurface it to the sales rep because their time is so precious. Yeah, and that dovetails nicely, and Tim, with what you were saying before about the, the sort of the value add second meeting here. But what else? What else have you seen, or what are you folks doing at um, at Terminus? Yeah, couldn't agree more with Tracy in terms of being value add and content is always super important. So whether they're they're enrolled in marketing or nurture there, but like I always tell the team like have an opinion on things as well. So you're human, have an opinion on how you can help your business, or if you see content you think would be valuable absolutely reach out. And then I think if you look at kind of segments in the market you're selling to, longer horizon, longer deal cycles are the name of the game in the enterprise, right? And so look at how your, your organization is structured to nurture and maintain those. Do those stay with the SDR, BDR team? Or are they trans transition to an AE? And so making sure you have clear rules and responsibility of like who's responsible for these and is it qualified and who's gonna work it? 
um, you know, that's something that's super important to the business that you just need to make sure you're set up the right way for your motion there. Um, what I will say to you that I, I, I don't think we talk enough about, and I'm a sales leader, I'm going to talk out both sides of my mouth on this, is um, leadership sets the tone. Like if you are trying to run boiler room and crank it out and turn and burn, like they're going to, your AEs, SDRs are going to have poor behaviors in terms of what this looks like. So if you tell your team, like, I care about pipeline this quarter and next quarter and the quarter after, and like, it's going to make our lives easier. And like, we understand, like, if you're running good sales motions and doing these things, like, like they need to understand it because they're going to care about what you care about and they're going to take their cue from sales leadership. And so having an understanding of like, how do we do this? How do we nurture this? And this is just as valuable a couple of months from now is important to do, but it's something we don't talk enough about because it's, you know, it's month end, it's quarter end, but like there's 12 months <laughs> we, we've got to fill. So I have one more thing I got to add to that, which is the notion of buyer groups. So, you know, a lot of times marketing thinks single, single threadedly, if that's a word, you know, there's one lead and it comes through and you pass it on. But most often, and I know this happens with Terminus, there's a buyer group involved. And we did a study one time at Inside View where we found as many as 34 people at an account were engaging with us. Now, our sales rep might have been talking to four of those that were in the perceived buyer group. But then there's all these other people, right, who are doing research and making recommendations and doing short lists and all this other stuff. So I think marketing's got to look at the big picture and tie it all together on the back end and do that lead to account mapping. And then let's say they're not ready yet. Okay, well, you keep nurturing all of them and all of that group, you never know where like a little flame will spark up in another part of the org. And I see Tim laughing. I'm pretty sure that's probably happened with Terminus Steel that happens with us all the time. So it's just, we have to think expansively about this and it's not just one lead equals one opportunity equals one deal anymore. Yeah, it's uh, the, the data we use now um, for the tech industry, there's 6.8 people involved in every buying decision. So we talk about buying groups and those things yeah. as well. And, you know, for, for an account-based marketing platform, that's what we say. It's like, you're selling to the company, not that person. And so like, if we're looking at sales tech. Yes, I'm going to be involved, but I'm probably not the person leading the evaluation and the research and things like this as well. And so what's that context again of like, who is this company to me? in terms of what they bought, what they're looking at, the conversations we have, where they are in the pipeline. So could, couldn't agree more. And I mean, it, it, if your sales leader hasn't said, don't be single threaded, I mean, yeah, we've all, we've all said that. <laughs> well, it's just stupid to assume that only executives matter, right? Like that's a big piece of it too. It's like, oh, I got to get to the CMO. All I'm going to do is go to my marketing ops leader and say, do you like this thing? Should we get it, right? And if she says yes, then I'll say yes, typically. I mean, it's kind of dumb, right? Like we really should realize there's this depth of, of continuity in an account. There's so much shift to that. I mean, connect with power, be multi-threaded, but like the reality is most executives hire, like, hire people smarter than yourself. You trust your team to go do the job and they're the ones deep in it. And yes, you want to get involved as, um, you know, sometimes it's a check the box. Sometimes you have input on, on it, but like most executives you'll find, I think, trust their teams to make decisions and, and, and do the leg work. And they're also going to be the people that are using it the most. How is it going to impact their day to day, like more than anything else? And, and, you know, trusting that team is something we see in the sales process and understand. So. I, I have I have some scary news for, for you on this topic. We've actually done a panel with uh, CEB not too long ago, the folks who do the research behind Challenger Sale, who came up with that uh, aforementioned 6.8. Uh, it is now, I think it's 11.7 no. people are involved. Uh. Now, now Gartner, Gartner says it's four. So somewhere between four and 35 people are involved in everything that you're selling. Um, well, and I'm hearing that great. like actually, procurement's yeah. a bigger one, right? That's another persona. Sorry to interrupt you, but like that's making no. it really hard for salespeople today because procurement wasn't always involved in the way they are now. Um, and I think that's a skill we have yeah. to develop. Yep. Well, and I think, I, I think it's something too. And, and Josh, I think you and I were actually chatting about this where, you know, you got to know who you're selling to now, whereas before maybe it was a, a VP or a, a people, um, you know, a head of people. Now it's actually the CFO who cares, not because yeah. they care about the solution, but because they care about the dollars. That's right. You really have to, you have to determine, you know, obviously up front, if you're an essential, if you're an essential business, um, or essential product for their business or non-essential and just be thoughtful about sort of how you're 
you're going about your sale. And I think the other point was is um, making use of storytelling and case studies is, is huge. Um, for us, we're focused on telling stories and showing relevant case studies to companies about how companies are being thoughtful about the return to work process. So um, we deal with a lot of commute um, sort of questions of you know, what's safe for my employees to get back to work. So we want to sort of leverage our examples um, and, and obviously get those examples in front of our customers and walk them through what that looks like. Um, but again, we want to do it in a thoughtful and empathetic way. Nobody wants to talk to somebody that's um, being pushy in their sales process. So it's, it's been super important for us. So I think what we've been doing is, is we've been informative. Um, we've been getting in front of customers, but then we've sort of been, um, you know, not as proactive as we normally would be, but keeping them up to date with the latest and greatest. And, and whether or not we're doing that through CRM or we're doing that in an automated, automated way or BDRs or reps are actually calling up and um, having conversations, um, I think it's been helpful in sort of every way we've, we've, we've tried over the last few months. Well, and I think that's a that's a good transition into actually our, our next point here, which are just some strategies that kind of always work. And I think leading like leading with empathy has always been a crowd pleaser. It's something that I think we've talked about for a long time in sales, but now it's certainly super important as we're going through a pandemic. Um, you know, Tim, you mentioned a bunch of good stuff, but what are some things that are kind of evergreen that you're seeing that are just working across uh, you know all all the different groups? Uh, I I love your slide. Works every time, first time. Uh, if, if that was the case, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but <laughs> tar we'll call it target rich environment. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, like I said, we, we've focused on, uh, do we have the right ICP, right, in some of these areas? And so there are certain um, segments of our business where we say 100% of these people should be our customers. And so we're spending more upfront to prospect into them with an understanding that we've defined that we can help their business better. So doing those things like um, leveraging Sendoso, even though the people at home, you can do, still do some cool things uh, like, you know, send an Uber Eats gift card or something like that and say, support a local restaurant, right? Support your favorite local restaurant doing these things and starting to combine that aspect of empathy with some sort of hook to get them on the phone and things. Um, and so that's been pretty successful for us, but really trying to do things that engage a larger team and provide that value add for those highest fit customers is really where we've leaned in there. And that's been helpful for us to have a focus and, and, and you know, be able to measure how we're moving that market there as well. And so that's, that's something I said, make sure you have the right ICP and how you look and segment your business. And then think about how you want to double down on the best fit ones and how you're going to get in front of them and go after them. Um, and, and yeah, how are you going to leverage that? And I think that fits in nicely to what we've heard as well a bunch of times, right? Focus on your customers. Hey, who looks like your customers, smells like your customers, acts like your customers, but isn't? That seems like a good place to start prospecting because birds of a feather generally have similar sorts of problems. So Josh, I want to kick it back to you here. You talked about you know, some of the empathy components of that, but what are some things that you've seen that really haven't changed as a result of this? Some prospecting strategies that have worked really, really well for you kind of throughout. Yeah, I think our, our BDRs and, and account managers are really focused on getting the product in the hands of our prospects and letting them sort of, you know, almost um, in a way, almost demo it. Um, we've done things like send vouchers to prospects, send vouchers to decision makers, let them try the product, let them get, have that experience and then provide feedback. We've done panels with prospects where we've asked them, hey, if we can build the perfect product, um, for you, what does that look like? Um, and then circled back uh, back to them when 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 we sort of have a V1 of that of that product. I think it's really just getting in front of people, being thoughtful, being empathetic, giving them a, a sort of view of what your biggest and best clients are doing, um, so that they can go out and sort of replicate that. We we've seen a number of customers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, a number of prospects come in and say, hey, we want to learn from you what's best in class. And so it's really about having those conversations and having account managers and sales folks join those calls to be as collaborative and, and, and as, as thoughtful as possible. Um, so I, I, I think that's really been, been great for us. And then I think it's pulling back a little bit on the objection handling 
Um, you know, I, 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 I don't want folks on my team to go after the companies that are saying, hey, we're cutting our costs across the company. We're not evaluating these types of solutions anymore. I think we've been, we've been good at sort of giving them pre-crafted responses for common objections so that they feel comfortable and they're not sort of pushing the hard sell. It's just not a great time for that right now. Yeah, and I think that, that goes in nicely with what you were saying. Kim, you mentioned this before, too. It's like, are you running a boiler room? Are you Wolf of Wall Street here? Or are you actually, are you, are you as a sales leader, leading with empathy and being, to, uh, Josh, to your point, being honest, right, about where we're at and what we're up to? Yeah, and to kind of piggyback on that real quick, you know, Josh, you mentioned something there. The number one question we get in customer success and sales is, is who does this well, right? So, like, Always the people, uh, everyone thinks the people down the street are doing it 10 times better than they're doing it. And everyone wants to know what the secret sauce is. And so, I mean, it's, it's not shocking that story selling is incredibly powerful, but especially not here and now where people are tr mm -hmm. trying to be, uh, to drive their business in a, in a new environment. Like they really are looking for that, those data points and those stories. And then if, if you're confident in your business and your product and your team, we talk about being a connector. Like one of the best things we can do is connect you with a person that's also solving this in a non-competitive industry and get out of your way. Like there's a big network effect to that to play a connector that people just, again, on that human and empathetic side, like people appreciate, thank you. Like, that's great. I think that, and, and obviously running sales community, right? We appreciate the value of connection too. And we see it happen serendipitously all the time and connecting your customers is great. Connecting your customers with your prospects is great. Tracy, what else? What are some other things that folks can do here that are that have kind of worked or continue yeah, to work in the space? This is a of new thing. And um, so up until I would say six months ago, I was a kind of an anti chat bot person. I just thought, oh, it's like a robot on my website and it's going to make everything feel plastic and I don't want to do that. Well, I've completely converted my opinion about that. Um, and we have put chat on our website. I hate thinking of it as a robot though. It's a conversational platform. That's what the vendor calls it anyway, but it really kind of is. We happen to one call, call we, we use one called qualified, but drift is great. Intercom's great. There's good ones out there. And, and here's, what's interesting. We are seeing people coming to the, uh, the site. We all know they're staying anonymous for a super long time. We are seeing them identify earlier because our SDR has engaged them in a conversation. So now we have their email and you know, nothing drives a marketer more crazy than all this anonymous, anonymous activity going on. And my sellers are asking like, what's, you know, what's happening with pipeline. So we are finding two dimensions happening in this conversational situation. So every page you go to, there is an automated like, hey, how you doing? I see you're on our site. If we happen to know who you are, it might say, hey, welcome Acme or welcome Modern Sales Pros. Um, and you have the choice right then as the person visiting to either talk to a human or not. And sometimes you don't. Um, and in addition to that, our SDRs are basically in this platform seeing who's coming on the site. They know you're on a certain page. They can intercept a conversation and offer to talk with you. And we're finding our conversations are going up like dramatically week over week. And about half the time it's because you, the visitor said, Hey, I want a human. And about half the time it's because our folks intercepted you. So that's the one I'm really interested in, right? Cause we basically caught you when you were coming in the store, you didn't think you wanted to talk to anybody. You were just browsing, but we got you to self identify and say, yeah, I'm Richard from modern sales pros. Ah, now we know who you are. Right. And we can start targeting and reaching out to you. So I just think this is a really important thing to pay attention to. Uh, it's like, it sounds like the worst furniture buying experience ever. You walk into the store. Now, how did, how did you end up with a new armoire? I, I don't know, man. They, they sucked me in. <laughs> um, I, I want to, I do want to encourage folks. We've got a couple more. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes left with these amazing panelists. If you do have questions, we've got some good ones from registration here, but we are going to move to a live Q and a component after we go through the next, um, the next section here, just kind of, bringing us home and getting really tactical. I mean, we talked about a lot today. We've talked about leading with empathy, being honest with your team. It starts at the top. We've hit on a whole bunch of things. Kim, what's just one kind of tactical thing, right? Somebody was not paying attention. They're coming back on right now. What's one tactical thing that folks can do and our audience can do to keep their prospects and customers just a little bit more engaged? Yeah. So, um, The motion with customers and prospects has always been like different. It's never been more different. And so what we're 
investing in our customer base in terms of value add, like round tables and additional sessions and additional resource and content focused on our existing customers has increased significantly just from our marketing budget as well as a headcount perspective. Like, are we, are we investing in the customers? Can you do that? And I would, I would really take a look at how much your sales and account management focus is, is pointed at the customer base as well as your marketing focus on the customer base as well. Um, I, I think oftentimes, like we talk about full funnel marketing, that includes, you know, renewing and growing the customer base. And so, um, like when people ask me all the time, like, hey, what should I look for in, in an ABM marketer? Um, 10 out of 10 marketers will have awesome top of funnel answers for what you should be doing. If you ask them about middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, and customer expansion, that's where you see kind of like what strategies are you running, what are you doing? And so really looking at that and understanding that your customers can also be your prospects and invest in them. And then from the prospect perspective, um, make like segment your, segment your account base and, and over invest in the best fit ones. Like, so if you're going to go after a net new business and you have an understanding, like these are the top 100, really go after them and, you know, put the dollars where they are and have executive alignment and get executive sponsors in there. Um, and just run a focus effort on those. And that's where we're seeing a lot of productivity and new logos come in. I think that's, I think that's sage advice. Pick your, pick your niche and get rich and exploit it and, and go after it. Um, Tracy, just anything super tactical that we want folks to, folks to take away from today? Yeah, think about the buyer group. Just always, always, always know whether it's a new logo or an existing customer, you cannot be single threaded to use Tim's ter term. So even if you have an existing customer and you know four people, well, go figure out another 10 because you know there's going to be some churn in that account and you need to find expansion. And as you're looking at new people coming in, know there's a buyer group and start targeting the other folks that are in there. There are more people involved in that deal than your sellers know about and, uh, and you can find them and help. And then Josh, anything, you know, super, super tactical things that folks can, uh, folks can take home today? Yeah, I think for us, it was really thinking about the value that we provided yesterday or pre-COVID is, is right now, if there's a chance it could be um, irrelevant. So just recognizing that, um, obviously reevaluating the, the content that you have, the collateral that you use. Um, and, and then, you know, one of the most, one of the most important um, things for us is really getting our teams to focus on collaboration and less about the pitch. Um, and, and I think that's been huge for us to really think about how we can partner with these companies versus the, the, the hard pitch, um, which is, it's helped us significantly, um, particularly early on when we were trying to gain trust um, and things were a bit in a frenzy. I think that's, I think that's definitely a tough one. So we're going to take a couple of questions here and then we'll kind of wrap up as a, as a group. Um, one of the questions that came in, and I, I love this question. Tim, I'm going to paraphrase for you, but this is a reg question that came in here. When, when's the right time to close it out because of non-engagement? Is there, is there ever a right time? Like, how do you know? I swear it's coming in next quarter. I swear once Tracy's back from vacation, but how do you, what, what guidance do you provide there? Yeah. So, so run a good deal level forecast meeting every week. So whether that's at your director level, VP level, or CRO level, like you've got to do that because people will get tired about asking, being asked about that same account there over and over. And finally you tell them to close it out. Um, from a data driven perspective, um, we measure pretty, uh, pretty closely stage progression. And we have a pretty good understanding of what a, a customer that buys looks like and their time spent in each stage and what a customer that doesn't buy looks like. So uh, close loss right now, and we're trying to bring this down, um, a closed loss deal spent uh, it's, it's right now a little over a hundred days longer in pipeline than a closed one deal. So as you, that's just bad forecasting and people like clutching onto stuff. Right. Um, but it's something to pay attention to because especially in a time like this where new business is hard, people don't want to show up with no pipeline, low pipeline. And so people will hold on to those bad opportunities more. And so your job as a sales leader is like, just have the real conversation of like, let's close it out. You can still go after it, but let's get it out. So the numbers aren't skewed. So. 
Yeah, that goes. That's why I love Josh's point before about just like be honest with yourself, be honest with the process. And I think that that I, I love that metric. Tracy, yeah, hop in. Yeah, I just had one thing to say, which is don't forget about those closed no decision statuses, right? That drive us all bonkers because in Tim's situation, he's getting his guys to clean out the pipeline. You got to call them no decision. You can't call them lost at that point. Well, marketing needs to have a process for those people, right? And sometimes you might call them a wake the dead campaign or something, right? But they're, make sure your marketers are ready to catch those people. 100%. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's an area too where it's. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. You, you go ahead. I, I take up all the air. No, I, I just wanted to say, I, I thought Tracy's point's an excellent one, right? Um, you know, we have a ton of deals that are sitting in this sort of limbo state, and it's really taken the eyes of marketing to collaborate with our account management and sales teams to figure out, you know, how do, how do, we, how do we push forward with these, with these customers? And, and also, it's, it's been a lot of outreach, a lot of, you know, empathetic outreach. You know, how are you doing? Here's what we're seeing across the board. Here's a case study we want to share with you. Um, light touches, as I like to call it, but just not letting it fall into a black hole. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely it's a good resurrection area, and it's something too we're being deliberate about those closed notes. Um, folks, we're going to go ahead and start to wind down here. So if you have any last questions, please do get those in the panel. Uh, we've got about a couple minutes left here, but one thing that that came up that I thought was really interesting, we've mentioned the empathy a lot here. Josh, you mentioned it, right? You mentioned honesty and all of that. This is a question we didn't prep for this. So I'm putting our panelists on a spot. Bear with me here. But Josh, do you think that that trend of sort of honesty and really being empathic with our customers, is that here to stay as a sales discipline? Or do you think that's something that will uh, evolve as the pandemic evolves? Well, I think you, you, we, you keep your content, you know, both relevant and sensitive to the crisis, right? I think the, the setting and communication and the expectations for your, your product, that's always gotta be honest. You, you've gotta be honest about what it is you're selling. I think you've gotta create really, what we try and do is create a safe environment, right? Uber's ubiquitous. We walk in, I walk into a, a, a boardroom and you know there's 15 people there and, and half the room wants to kill me and half the room um, you know, wants to ask a million questions about the platform and then you have a couple you know, um, folks that are, are indifferent, right? So you want to create a safe environment for customers to have that communication, um, both, you know, with me, um, with each other, et cetera. Uh, so that piece I think is, is new. Um, whereas, you know, we, I have customers call me up all the time and say, Hey, how do I navigate sort of this situation? I need to get my employees from A to B. I'm a little worried about it. Um, those conversations, I think, are, are, are relatively new. Um, I, I'm not, I wasn't consistently having those pre-COVID. Um, but I think it's also identifying and empowering, you know, really your most loyal customers um, to, to understand the value proposition of your product, how that can help them get through these times and beyond, and becoming a trusted partner. So I, I do think things have changed, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, and I do think they're here to stay. And I think for, for the betterment of, of both, um, you know, the, the customer, you know, and, and the prospect as well. Yeah, I think selling has fundamentally changed. Like um, one, personal and professional lives have never blended together more significantly. So like there's a near and midterm thing of like, is it work from home or is it live at work? Like it's a little bit of both right now. <laughs> um, and so having an understanding of like what people are going through and doing that, I think we're all going through it. So that empathy is automatically there. Um, the, on the other side of that, I think just selling has changed. Like I don't, I, my team, I, I tell them selling's dead. We're educating and advocating. We're gonna educate about how we can actually, how we feel we can help your business. We're gonna educate you on the platform. Then we're gonna advocate for how we solve that problem for you because our competitors are going to advocate for a different way to solve that problem. But like buyers are smart, give people more credit. Like there's no people that aren't tech savvy out there now. Like, so educate, advocate, but do it with, you know, high character and that understanding that like, it's got to work that value exchange for both sides. And so those are the people that their value added meetings. You don't feel like you're wasting time when you hop on a, 
a quote unquote sales call with them and things like that as well. So setting that, setting that expectation from the top down of here's how we do things. Right. And it's okay to like approach it in certain ways and close deals and do those. Um, but educate and advocate is what we talk a lot about. This is, this was phenomenal gang and Tracy, I would be remiss if I didn't offer you a quick second to add anything here before we wrap up. I just love what you said about educate and advocate. I think that's a great frame of mind because I'm thinking about a, as a buyer, when I have that interaction, it just feels good. And I like, I just did a deal on Friday where I bought ahead some licenses with an account manager and I really, really like her and it was her month end and I didn't actually need to do it for like another two weeks, but it's like, Jess, I'm going to help you out here. I'm going to do that. And she has engaged with me in exactly the way you're talking. So it's like, you know, I think the personal touch is really important right now. I think this is, and look at that, we're right at time. Uh, Tracy, Tim, Josh, thank you. I've got four pages worth of notes here. That almost never happened. So amazing conversation. I know you all are incredibly, incredibly busy. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy day to share amazing perspective with the MSP community. And then on behalf of the entire team behind the scenes and everybody in the community, to the Uber team, thank you so much for the sponsorship and helping us pull this programming together. It was, uh, it was awesome. And with that, we're right at three o'clock in the East Coast here on the nose. Everybody stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.